Dusty.
Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Good to see you folks here in the sanctuary. We welcome those also joining us via our live stream. Let me encourage you to open your program all the way up, tear off your connection card, put your name on it, and uh, there will be some things later in the service as we go through the announcements that you can put on the back in addition to any prayer requests you'd like to share with us at the end of the service. I think most of you know you can put those in the offering boxes on either side of the door as you leave the sanctuary along with any offerings you'd like to share uh, with the church today. Let's stand together. We're going to read our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 3. Let's read this aloud together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Psalm 95, 1 through 3. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we worship you this morning, may we exalt you as the great God above all gods, King of kings, Lord of lords. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us, Lord. And we just want to uh, praise your name this morning. And we pray. We do so in, with, uh, you know, filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, oh, oh.
one of those. How do you just not cry when you realize we have a Savior who loves us so much? You may be seated.
Again, I feel like we've had a sermon in the songs this morning already. But we're going to take a moment to uh, pray together, so I encourage you to uh, take, what is it, a yellow insert today, canary-colored insert out of your bulletin. On one side is our praise and prayer list. The other side is the announcements. We'll get to that later. But uh, pick out a few prayer requests and uh, pray for those silently as I pray out loud. Of course, lift up your own concerns this morning as well. I know that many of us come with our own burdens today, and so uh, we want to be uh, praying about that. Uh, some of you have been praying with us for uh, Franzi from our uh, English Corner group about getting a job. Franzi has a job, so praise God, Franzi's here. <laughs> All right, so uh, our mission focus today is uh, our camps, Lake Retreat, Camp Bighorn, and uh, these are our two converged camps in the area, Camp Bighorn's in Montana, Lake Retreat's in Ravensdale, Washington. Some of you have been to Lake Retreat, uh, but let's lift up our camps. I myself came to know Jesus at a Christian camp, much like Lake Retreat, and uh, so they can be very uh, effective in uh, helping people come to know Jesus, giving them time away from their stress of their regular lives. Both camps also have discipleship schools, which are designed for students graduating from high school but not yet ready to go to college, so they take what's called a gap year. And uh, it is a discipleship school, so it's heavy on Bible input into their lives and just prayer and asking God what the next steps might be for their lives. And so. Uh, they both have those, uh, I think at Lake Re Retreat, it's called the Delphia Discipleship School. At uh, Camp Bighorn, it's called Journey Discipleship School, okay? So let's uh, keep our camps in prayer as well. well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for the opportunity to come together and worship you and sing praise to your name and study your word and pray together and just be together to encourage one another. And so uh, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the spiritual blessings that we share in Christ. Thank you for our family blessings. Thank you, Lord, uh, for our material blessings as well. We recognize everything we have comes from your hand. And we trust in your sovereign control over all things. We trust in your infinite wisdom. We trust in your perfect love and your unlimited power. Each of us comes before you today, Lord, with various concerns on our hearts and minds, and we want to lift those up to you. We pray for those that are dealing with health issues. We pray for your uh, healing touch and sustaining grace there. We pray for those, Lord, that, uh, that have, uh, you know, family issues going on. We pray that you would... Uh, you know, where forgiveness is needed, that would happen. Where um, repentance is needed, that would happen. Where uh, just uh, kindness is needed, that would happen. And we pray for those that are dealing with uh, any kind of mental, emotional stress in their life. We speak the peace of Christ into those situations, Lord. And, and uh, we, we want to practice what you've told us to do, to cast all our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. And so uh, we lift up those concerns. We lay them at the foot of the cross, and we trust you to work in each one of those situations and we do rejoice with Franzi that he has got a job he's been working a couple of days so far this week and just may you help him to uh, continue to be a workman approved unto you uh, to work hard there we pray for our families of the week we pray for Debbie Ledoux for Paul and Carol Lindlow for Ron Linville and for Eileen from our youth group Lord, may you work in each one of these, uh, the lives of these folks and encourage them, draw them close to you, uh, heal where healing is needed, encourage where that's needed, um, where, you know, just, just give them, fill them with your spirit, Lord. Just give them a hunger and thirst to study your word and spend time in prayer. And we pray that for each one of us as well, Lord, that you would continue to uh, transform us more and more into the image of Christ each and every day. We also want to pray for our uh, mission focus today for our camps, Lake Retreat and Camp Bighorn. We thank you for these camps and for the work that they do and uh, for the many people that go to these camps for various uh, weekend retreats or week-long camps and uh, where they are exposed to your word and uh, your spirit is changing lives through these camps. And we pray that would continue to happen. Uh, throughout this year and especially this summer. May each week of camp be filled with campers and may you prepare them for divine appointments uh, with you, Lord. 
And uh, we also want to pray for our world, what's going on in the world. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Uh, we pray for our own nation, Lord, for the leaders in our nation, that they would have wisdom and guidance and direction from you, that they would seek you. We pray in this next uh, election season, Lord. I don't know that anybody's really looking forward to all these negative ads that are going to show up on TV here before long. But, Lord Jesus, we pray for godly men and women to be elected to positions of leadership and, and that you, Lord, by your Spirit, would just, um, you know, fill them and guide them and, and uh, you know, give them your vision for our country, we pray, Lord. We pray for the various conflicts going on around the world, especially uh, between uh, Israel and Hamas and the Gaza Strip, and, and so many people are displaced and, and uh, hungering and, uh, you know, facing famine there in Gaza, and uh, we just pray for relief supplies to get in there, and we just pray that there can be a, a resolution to this problem, a peaceful resolution, Lord, that would, now, would, would enable, you know, both Israel and the Palestinians to, to get along with each other. We know this has been a long-running problem. And, uh, Lord, you're the only one that can work and bring about some kind of solution, so we pray for that. And the same thing with, with Ukraine and Russia, Lord. We pray you'd work in that situation. We pray for divine intervention and uh, spiritual breakthroughs there and for a peaceful uh, solution. So many people are dying. So many people are suffering. And, uh, Lord, we're just praying that... Uh, you know, you would work in the hearts and minds of leaders that have the ability to, to bring that war to an end. And, uh, Lord, now as we turn to studying your word, we pray again that you would speak to us, that you would open our eyes and ears to hear what you want to teach us. And uh, may we learn something new from your word. May we take it to heart. May your spirit impress it upon us uh, that we might grow and, again, become more the people you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 7 through 19 this morning. And in your program, there's also a message outline I encourage you to take out and make some notes on so that you'll have some thoughts to uh, take home uh, with you today, all right? Uh, so far, in our study of Hebrews, well, we, we've looked at the theme of Hebrews, which is the supremacy of Jesus over everyone and everything. And the author of Hebrews, we don't know his exact uh, name, but he has shared with us that Jesus, first of all, is supreme over the Old Testament prophets, that he is uh, superior to the angels, and that he is superior to Moses. We talked about that last week. And we, we, uh, the author has shared with us that just because Jesus took on full humanity in addition to his full divinity, uh, that did not lessen him. That did not make him inferior uh, to the angels. But uh, it was important that he would take on full humanity in addition to full divinity that he had so that he could relate to us, he could represent us, he could die on the cross and pay the penalty uh, for our sins. And along the way, I shared with you, as the author shares with us about Jesus' superiority over everything, he's going to share five warnings with us. Just about every single one of the warnings has to do with God's Word in some way, shape, or form. And so the first warning to us was to, uh, you know, to listen to Jesus. Jesus is God's final word. He's superior to the prophets. He's God's final word. So listen to him. Pay attention to what you have heard. And then... Uh, we had, uh, it wasn't really a warning, but an exhortation last week to fix our thoughts on Jesus. But today we're going to get to what's technically the second major warning in Hebrews, and that's a warning against unbelief due to a hard heart, okay? So that's where we are, and that's where we're going, so let's dive right in. I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, follow along as I read. So, so as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. 
But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Well, in this passage, we're going to see to avoid unbelief uh, due to a hard heart, we need to submit our hearts to God's word and God's ways, especially during difficulties, especially amid difficulties, okay? So the first point this morning that we see in this passage is submit to God's authority through his inspired word. God's word speaks directly to us today, all right? That's the message of verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, today, as you hear his voice, God's word speaks directly to us. The Holy Spirit has inspired God's word. And the author goes on, the author of Hebrews goes on right after he says that to quote from Psalm 95. Now we read as our call to worship this morning the th first three verses of that, but these verses occur later on in that psalm, uh, Psalm 95. But it's God's inspired word, and it speaks to us today just as it spoke to the people back then. So the starting point to avoiding a hardened heart is to recognize and submit to God's authority through his inspired word. If we sit on judgment uh, of God's word, criticizing the things we don't agree with as outdated or in error, our hearts are, uh, are, are challenging God. To learn from God, we need to submit to his inspired word, and it's important that we interpret it correctly. Uh, go ahead to the next sub-point there on the outline. Uh, uh, there we go. And go ahead, fill in the blank there. <laughs> All right, God's Word speaks directly to us today. Yes. So we need to interpret it uh, correctly. How do you interpret the Word of God correctly? Some people are prone, you know, to flip through the Bible, find a verse, they pull it out, and they twist it around and make it say what they want it to say, okay? But there's a proper way to interpret God's Word. So first of all, like what we're doing with the book of Hebrews, and like, like what I try to do with all of my messages, is we work our way through a book, okay? That book has a theme. And so, uh, you know, each of the verses in that book um, has a context that it occurs in. And so we try to think about the context, right? The superiority of Jesus Christ or the warnings that, uh, that the author is giving us in the case of Hebrews. So uh, we, how do you interpret the, the Word of God properly? You need to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten your understanding. Make sure that we take the context into account when we're, we're studying what did it mean to the, to the people initially and then what principle rises out of that that still might apply to us today. We want to interpret the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, right? We're under the New Covenant. Therefore, when we read about the Old Covenant, we need to do so through the eyes of the New Covenant because the Old Covenant was meant to point forward to Jesus, okay? Um, and then we need to uh, recognize literal and figurative language. So when you read the Psalms and it says, the trees clap their hands, does that mean uh, that we should say, the Bible's in error? Trees don't have hands. They can't clap. No, why is it not in error? Because that's poetry. So you need to understand what kind of literature you're reading in the Bible. There's poetry in the Bible. There's historical accounts in the Bible. There's, there's uh, you know, uh, prophetic statements, and there's um, futuristic kind of statements. So you have to kind of pay attention to what kind of literature I'm reading in the Bible in order to interpret it correctly, okay? So that's just a quick 
uh, a quick run through quick uh, of what we call hermeneutics, uh, understanding and interpreting scripture. But God's word speaks directly to us today. Today, just like it did back then, the author is telling us. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, we're living in this today time where it's a time of grace that God has extended through the whole world, giving people opportunity to respond to the gospel. So today, if you hear his voice. Second sub point now under point number one, we should learn from the biblical stories how to avoid the sins of those who lived before us. We should learn from the biblical stories how to avoid the sins of those who lived before us. The Apostle Paul tells us about studying the Old Testament that these stories were written down for our benefit so that we can learn from them, okay? And that's um, just what the author of Hebrews does. He goes back and he quotes from Psalm 95. And this is a warning against the sin of unbelief. And uh, it references an event in the life of the Israelites that likely took place in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, you may recall the story of God's deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt. They'd been delivered from slavery in Egypt by God's mighty power under the leadership of Moses. And they were led through the Red Sea on dry ground and into the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And God had done all kinds of miracles to get them that far, right? He did all the plagues, and he sends Moses, and Moses leads them out, and uh, they... The, he, God parts the Red Sea, they cross through, Pharaoh's army tries to follow, gets swallowed up by the Red Sea. Now they're in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And they get three days in, and what happens? They're hungry, they're thirsty, and they start grumbling, and they start complaining. And God provides for them, okay? He provides for them. And uh, they keep walking. And then, they, they, then there comes another time in Exodus 17 where they're hungry and they're thirsty and they start grumbling and they start complaining and they say, we're going to die out here. We want to go back to Egypt. Even if we were under slavery, at least we had something to eat and we had something to drink. But we're going to die out here. Moses, what have you done? Why did we follow you in the first place? So they're grumbling and complaining. Rather than asking God to provide, after they'd seen miracle after miracle, they quarreled with Moses and they put God to the test. And God instructed Moses at that point to strike a rock. Remember the story? Strike a rock with his staff and out of it uh, gushed water. And Moses named that place, two names, Masa, which means a test, and Meribah, which means a quarrel. It's where the people quarreled with him and they tested God, okay? Now, the last part of the psalm, referring to God swearing an oath in his anger that the Israelites shall never enter my rest. In this case, rest means the promised land. They won't get into the promised land. That story probably comes from Numbers 14 when the people grumbled after the report of the spies about giants and fortified cities in the promised land. Remember that story? God brings them finally to the edge of the promised land. They send 12 spies in to check out the land. God says, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. I'll get you in. Don't worry about it. it it's yours. But the spies go in. Ten of them come back and say, ah! we can't go in. There's large people there. There's fortified cities. We're just a, a ragtag group. We're not going to be able to defeat them. We can't do it. We shouldn't do it. But Joshua and Caleb come back and say, we can do it. We can do it. With God's help, anything is possible. But who did the people believe? The ten. So they had a, heart of, a hardened heart of unbelief and so God says to that generation, you will never enter my rest. You're not going to enter the promised land. And they all had to die out in the wilderness before a new generation rose up. Now, Joshua and Caleb didn't die out, but those who had a hardened heart had to die out. And so this is what that is referring to, where God swore an oath in his anger that they shall never enter my rest. <clears throat> 
So the point is, we should learn from their sins and do things differently. We should not succumb to a hardened heart and a, and a, and a situation of unbelief, okay? So numerous occasions in this passage that I read for you, the word heart is mentioned. A heart of unbelief, a hardened heart. Okay, so this is point two. Uh, Subpoint number one, all sin starts in the heart. All sin starts in the heart. So what's the biblical concept of the heart? We read about this uh, in scripture uh, a number of times. You can go on to the next point. Uh, um, all sin starts in the heart, okay? Uh, the, according to the Bible, it encompasses our thoughts, our emotions, our desires and intentions. And it's the seed of our spiritual life and plays a crucial role in our relationship with God and others. So when you read about heart in the scripture, that's what we're talking about. The heart represents the core of our being, the essence of who we are, our thoughts, our emotions, desires, and intentions. And it's the seed of our spiritual life. And as I said, it plays a crucial role in our relationship with God and others. Now, we read a lot about the heart in the scriptures. Jeremiah 17.9 says that an unregenerate heart, a heart where somebody has not yet put their faith and trust in Jesus, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Okay? And Jesus says in Matthew 17.19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. So you see that the heart is is where sin starts in the core of our being it's where it starts and it's what needs to be transformed to get your heart right with God what do you need to do you need to confess and repent of your sins okay if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved and again the the importance of understanding the fact that we are under the new covenant not the old covenant remember from our study of the book of Ezekiel God promised to provide a new covenant one of the key components of that new covenant is that God would take our hearts of stone that's our unbelieving hearts hard-hearted unbelieving hearts and he would transform them through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit so that our hearts become hearts of flesh a heart of flesh as opposed to a heart of stone. A heart of stone is hardened and unbelieving against God. A heart of flesh is receptive to God, sensitive to the things of God, responding to God. Does that make sense? Okay. So the new covenant can transform your heart, that heart of stone, and make it a heart of flesh so that you're able to respond to God and it's the work of the Holy Spirit doing that as we confess and repent of our sins. Sub point number two then we have a responsibility to encourage each other not to harden our hearts. We see this in verse 13 but encourage one another daily as long as it's called there's that word again today so that none of you may be hardened by sins deceitfulness. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility to encourage one another not to have a hardened heart, not to have a heart of unbelief. We need each other. We need each other. I'll talk about that in a moment. But sin is deceitful. It makes promises it can't deliver. It deceives people by making people feel that God is against them, that his law and his ways are unreasonable that they are righteous in themselves. I don't need God. I've got righteousness myself. God should let me into heaven because I'm such a great person. That's deceitful sin. Okay? And and it, it deceives us by making us think, you know, sin is not as bad as it is. Right? Everybody's doing it. It's not that bad. It's attractive on the surface, sin is, but underneath it leads away from our faith and trust in God and ultimately toward destruction and death. Why do we need each other? 
to help steer us away from a hardened heart and a heart of unbelief because we can't always see our sinful, where our sinful choices might be leading us. You think you've got blind spots in your life sometimes? I know I do. And you know, sometimes we can see things in other people that we can't see so much in ourselves. <laughs> and so what do we do as brothers and sisters in Christ in that situation? We see a brother or sister headed down a path that is not the path that God wants them on, that's going to lead to a hardened heart and a heart of unbelief. We come alongside them and we speak the truth in love. We speak the truth in love. We come alongside and say, hey, I'm concerned about you. I love you. I care about you. I want to see you walking closely with Jesus and these choices that you're making, this direction that you're going, it's not going to take you there. Please, please, turn around. I'll walk with you, but turn around. Let's get back on track with Jesus, okay? That's why we need to encourage each other. And we see in this passage, sub-point number three, that our hardness of heart stirs up God's anger, judgment, and discipline. God will not let his beloved sons and daughters persist in sin. We're going to see this later in Hebrews, but he will discipline us to get our attention and his Holy Spirit will bring conviction upon our hearts to lead us to repentance. But people who refuse to confess and repent of their sins are not God's beloved sons and daughters and will ultimately face his judgment and wrath. The people in the desert with Moses, so many of them, they weren't God's beloved sons and daughters. So he took them out of Egypt, but they didn't believe. They didn't trust in him. Was that a momentary decision on God's part to say, you shall never enter my rest? You blew it once, you shall never enter my rest. Was that the way it was? No. God had showed them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again that he would take care of them, that he loved them, that he would provide for them. But he wanted them to learn to trust him. But they had a hardened heart of unbelief, and they wouldn't. So finally, their sin cup was full, and God said, Enough! You shall never enter my rest. Okay? But that wasn't a, a split-second decision on God's part. No, he gave them chance after chance after chance after chance, but they persisted because of their unbelief and hard hearts toward God. So, third point, we must recognize and submit to God's ways. We must recognize and submit to God's ways. We are responsible to learn God's ways. Verse 10, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. They didn't learn. They didn't learn about God's ways. For 40 years in the wilderness, and even before that, as God delivered them from Egypt, the Israelites had the opportunity to learn God's ways because they saw the miraculous things that he did and how he provided for his people. These people in the wilderness should have known God's ways, but they refused to acknowledge and learn God's ways and submit to them. Now the time to learn God's ways is before we get in a difficult situation. God has revealed himself in Jesus and in his word, and we can learn God's ways by fixing our eyes on Jesus, that was one of the main points last week, and studying God's word, right? The Apostle Paul said, why do you have the Old Testament? So you can learn from these folks, both the good things they did and the bad things they did. So you don't have to repeat the same lessons that they did. God's ways, Isaiah tells us, are not our ways. They are so much higher, okay? In fact, sometimes I think in myself, not my necessarily spiritual self, okay, but in my human self, my ungodly self, this is what I think I ought to do. 
my spiritual self then kicks in and says, well, if that's what my fleshly self says I ought to do, I probably should do the exact opposite because God's ways <laughs> are not my ways, okay? They are so much higher. Now, God's ways, sub-point number two here, God's ways are sometimes revealed in miracles, but they alone will not change a hard heart. God's still in the business of doing miracles, but miracles alone will not change a hard heart. How do we know that? Those who went astray in the wilderness under Moses' leadership had seen some of the greatest miracles that God has ever done. They saw it with their own eyes. The parting of the Red Sea. Plague after plague after plague coming against Egypt, and they weren't touched by any of them. They saw some of the greatest miracles. Moses striking a rock and water gushing forth. God bringing quail every morning and manna into the wilderness. You go out, pick up what you need for the day, the next day the same thing happens. They saw miracle after miracle. If miracles alone could soften hard hearts, these people should have been mighty in faith. But they weren't. Have you ever heard somebody say, or maybe you've said it to yourself, if I just saw a miracle, I would believe. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You might believe for a time, but the next difficulty, if no miracle shows up, I don't believe anymore. God doesn't care about me. You know, most people that make that statement, it's just a smokescreen. And it, it's an excuse. So they can continue in their sin. Think about the parable Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember that story? The, the, the poor guy, Lazarus, uh, and, and the rich man wouldn't give him anything to eat. And they both die. And Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom, heaven, Lazar and, and the rich man goes to hell. And Jesus imagines kind of a gap there where the rich man can talk to Abraham. And he's suffering, but he says to Abraham, Abraham, you know, please send somebody to warn my brothers. Please send somebody to warn my brothers. And Abraham says, you know, no. And he says, but if only somebody would rise from the dead and talk to them, they would believe. And Abraham says, no, they wouldn't. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if somebody rises from the dead. So miracles alone will not change a hard heart. God's ways, sub-point number three here, God's ways often involve trials for his people. Hear that. God's ways often involve trials for his people. I like this picture. Let's go to the picture. There's my plan in life. I'm going to start out on my bike, and it's going to be smooth sailing to the finish line. That's my plan. That's my way. God's plan. There's all kinds of obstacles and difficulties and valleys and mountains and floods and fire and you name it. But as we sang in the song, he'll hold me fast. He'll get me through. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that? You know, God took his people out of Egypt. If he had taken them in a straight line from Egypt to the promised land, do you know how long that would have taken? Twelve days. Could have been in, in, the, in, in the promised land in twelve days. But they spent 40 years getting there. Now, part of that was their fault. 
because he did give them an opportunity. It wasn't just 12 days, but, you know, a few years in, they could have got to the promised land. <laughs> but they had a sinful heart of unbelief. And so it took them longer. But God, the Scripture tells us, God worked with them in the desert so they would learn to trust him and turn to him and know that he would provide for them. And, and in difficulties that he would help them and he taught them also the scripture tells us warfare during that time because going into the promised land what were they going to need warfare skills what didn't they have being slaves in Egypt warfare skills but God taught them so we need to understand that God's ways often involve trials for his people Subpoint number four, when we are confronted with God's ways, we have the option of submitting to him or grumbling and going back to the world. We can allow trials to make us bitter, or we can allow trials to make us better and lead, uh, uh, you know, to, to lead us to unbelief or to teach us to trust in God even more. Trials can lead us to unbelief and a hard heart, or they can lead us to trust in God even more. Think back to our recent study of the books of Samuel and David's life. God comes to David through Samuel. David's a young shepherd boy, and Samuel anoints him to be the next king. But do you remember how long it took for that promise to become reality in David's life? Was it the next day? Was it the next year? Was it the next 10 years? Was it the next 20 years? It was between 22 and 25 years after that promise was made to David that he was actually anointed by both the northern tribes and the southern tribe as their king. Remember what happened in between? Was he riding his bike on this smooth line to the finish line? He was running for his life. Saul was trying to kill him over and over and over again. And there was a point. I don't know if you remember that point, but there was a point where David started to develop a hard heart and a heart of unbelief. As Saul continued to pursue him, he finally, he doesn't pray about this, but he just makes the statement. I don't know if you remember him making it, but he says, you know what? I'm doomed. Saul is going to kill me one of these days. My only option is to escape to Gaza, the Philistine territory, and live amongst the Philistines. You remember when he made that decision? And then... The Philistines expected him to become part of their army and go to war against the Israelites. But luckily God spared him, got him out of there, convicted him of that sin, and he repented of that sin of unbelief and that hard heart got him back on track. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had times like that. You know where I think it most often affects us, where we're start to go down that path of a hardened heart and a heart of unbelief it's when we're praying and praying and praying about something and it doesn't happen the way we think it should happen and in the timing that we should think it would happen I remember a clear case for me in my church in Southern California I still weep about it there were three leadership couples that got into marital problems all at the same time, all headed toward divorce. And I pled with them. I counseled them. I cried out to them, don't do it. And one by one by one, they all got divorced and left the church. But I fasted and I prayed in the midst of all of that. I mean, God hates divorce. I thought I knew what God's desire would be. And I was like Abraham. 
when God told him he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and remember what Abraham said? Lord, if there's 100 righteous people there, will you spare it? If there's 50, if there's, if there's one. And I was crying out to God saying, God, give me one of these couples, please, that would reconcile, confess and repent of their sins and reconcile so they would be an example to the others that it was possible. And I didn't get one. And it shook my faith deeply. I didn't want to pray for a long time after that. If the church only knew, I was going through the motions. Sunday morning, getting up and preaching, I was going through the motions. But finally, God turned me around. The Holy Spirit <laughs> convicted me and said, you know, I got this, Mark. I know it didn't go the way you wanted it to go. But, you know, I just had to put it in his hands and trust. And I got back on track. But there was a time where I had a hard heart of unbelief because my prayers were not answered the way I wanted them to be answered. And so, you know, we've got to come to that place just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, take this cup from me, but if it's not your will, not my will be done, but your will be done. So we need to know this, that you know when we go through trials, we have the option of submitting to him or grumbling and going back to the world. James encourages us, right? Chapter 1. What does it say? Consider it all joy when you experience trials of different kind, knowing that the testing of your faith will mature you. I summarized it, will mature you. Subpoint number five, to refuse to submit to God's ways is to put God to the test. God says in verse nine, your ancestor tested and tried me. At the root of testing again is this sin of unbelief. God, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe. But we need to, I guess I didn't, part of what drew me out of that place where I was, where I just didn't feel I could pray anymore because I didn't think my prayers made any difference, I just went back to praising God and looking in the past and saying, okay, God, I know you were working here. I praise you for that. I know you were working here. I praise you for that. I know you were working here. Thank you for that. And I just, you know, just started praising him and thanking him for anything and everything that I could. And that was what my prayer life was like for a while, just praising him and thanking him because <laughs> I just needed to be reminded of all that he had done in the past. But to, to refuse to submit to God's ways is to put God to the test, okay? Um, and that's usually not a good thing to do. <laughs> four, point number four, when we submit to God's word and God's ways, we enter into his rest. Now, next week, we're going to talk a lot about God's rest. I think I'm out of time. Am I out of time? Yeah, I did set that clock ahead. <laughs> I thought we still had an hour to go, folks. But <laughs> uh, when we submit to God's word and God's ways, we enter into his rest. The Israelites missed out on God's rest, which for them was the promised land. But that's a picture for us of the new heaven and the new earth that we can look forward to. We're going to talk more about that next week, so I'm not even going to go further into that at this point. But, you know, God said, you won't enter my rest, but we can enter into God's rest when we submit to his word and his ways. We enter into his rest. So let me just wrap it up. One of God's ways that is most unlike our ways is the cross, right? It's the cross. Jesus, the sinless son of God, died as the sacrifice for ungodly sinners, God justifies the ungodly through faith alone, not on the basis of our good works. That runs counter to human pride. So have you trusted in Jesus' blood alone as your hope for heaven? That's God's way. 
to heaven, not your own good works. If you've already done that, then I would ask the second question. Is your, heart of, is your heart in submission to God's word and his ways? Especially when those ways involve a trip through the barren wilderness. And most likely it's going to involve trials and difficulties. You know why? Because God is more concerned about our sanctification than our happiness. God wants us to become more and more like Jesus. He wants us to learn to trust him more and more. How do we learn those things? By going through some difficult times where we have to rely on him more and more. If life was just riding your bike on that flat line to the finish line, what need would you have for Jesus? I can do this. But when you got the bumps and the valleys and the, the floods and the fires and the windstorms and the difficulties, boy, I can't do this myself, Lord. I need you. I need you. So is your heart in submission to God's word and his ways? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And, you know, as the scripture said, <laughs> quite literally, today. <laughs> Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Lord, help us not to have hardened hearts. If anybody here this morning has a hardened heart of unbelief because maybe their prayers have not been answered the way they want or in the time in which they wanted it answered, Lord, would you by your spirit just convict them of that and draw them to yourself. May they remember all the ways that you have worked in their life up to this point, all the blessings that you have given them. and. Just restore their faith and trust in you, Lord, and help them to realize, you know, your ways. It's not a, it's not a smooth sailing. There are times of smooth sailing, but it's not continuous smooth sailing. There are, 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 are challenges, many challenges along the way. And that's by your design, Lord, that we might grow to trust you. And so would you turn their hearts back to you those of us that uh, maybe aren't in in that situation this morning lord help us to remember that your ways aren't our ways and may we submit to your word in your ways so that we can continue to become more and more like jesus and we pray it in his name amen all right quickly some announcements this morning please finish filling out your connection card I mentioned there might be a couple of things you want to note on there. We've got a church workday coming up on the 23rd, 9 a.m. to noon. If you'd be willing to help with the workday, would you write workday on the back of your uh, connection card so we know that you, we can count on you to help? Uh, we've got an Easter breakfast coming up Easter uh, Sunday morning. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the church on the card table there. You can sign up to bring some food for that. I know there's about six or seven folks that have already signed up, but please sign up. Uh, some of you just put your bring, you know, I the, what you're bringing. It says egg dish, and you said scrambled eggs. Well, put your name down so we know who it is, okay? <laughs> you can say what you're going to bring, but put your name with it so we know uh, who it is, okay? Um, we've got Bible studies, too, during the week. I think you know, most of you know that. Thursdays at 7, Sunday at 9, 10 a.m. We'd love to have you be part of one of those Bible studies. Uh, uh, we've got... Um, a Good Friday communion service coming up on Good Friday at 7. Plan to come. And then, of course, the Easter breakfast and Easter worship. Invite family, friends, and neighbors to that, okay? Let's see if we can fill this place out on Easter Sunday, all right? Uh, let me just, uh, again, any offering you want to share, along with your connection card, you can go ahead and place it in the offering boxes on either side of the door as you leave the sanctuary. Let me just pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, for uh, your many gifts, your many blessings. All that you've given to us, we acknowledge, comes from your hand, Lord. And as we give, may we give out of a heart of worship, a heart of faith and belief, just thanking you for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. And uh, as we give with a desire to see your kingdom come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save Thank you. 
It's been a joy to worship with you this morning, and I want to encourage you to stay and enjoy some refreshments. If you'd like individual prayer, Paul and Carol Linlow will be up here by the communion table. Come on up. They'd be pleased to pray with you, whatever might be on your heart and mind this morning. But let's go forth with believing hearts, trusting in the Lord. Let's receive the benediction. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen.